Well, please, um, as we're coming back into this new formation after many um, uh, months, really years of um, being in different situation, it's going to take a while for us to get everything kind of uh, retuned up. So I just invite everyone to move your seat a little bit. Um, we're all kind of a little straight today. So if you're on the edges, it's probably you're going to have to go like this the whole time. So feel free to shift if you're outside um, and you want to come here in the center so you can see, um, bring chairs around uh, there. You can sit out. Um, feel free to bring your chair up on the on the patio or out there a little bit on the gravel and just kind of make yourself as comfortable as um, as you can. And like I said, we are um, in a, a phase of rearranging to going back to the way that we um, had Sunday assemblies for many, many years. Uh, and then during COVID, we had to do a lot of uh, rearranging to make it to make it work. And one of those things was the social distancing and only 20 people in the hall and people outside and tents and speakers and cameras and all of these different things. And so um, we're, we're kind of trying to renormalize. And so any feedback you have about that as we go along, please feel free to um, talk with uh, someone uh, who you see organizing things or to um, email the, the temple, the office at buddhaai.org. Because um, we can't tell, people who are organizing that, we can't tell what the experience is from the other side. Um, and so it's really helpful, especially those of you, if, if there's anyone listening online, uh, if you can give some feedback uh, through email. Um, that's really helpful. It helps us to tune everything, and we'll take a little time um, to put to put that together. I hope you're enjoying summer. It has arrived, and uh, anyone get a chance to see any runners or jumpers or throwing heavy ballers of one kind or another? Just a little bit, right? I didn't realize what a big deal this was. I was like, oh yeah, there's people coming to run. You know, that's great. Track Town USA, whatever it was, and my uh, my wife Azusa, one of her classmates um, from high school, uh, her son was in the the uh, marathon, and so they came to visit us uh, last weekend, and we were talking, and and then I kind of figured it out. Oh, this is the Olympics, this is the Olympics of of track, because you know I thought, oh, that's great, he's a marathon runner, oh, good for you, and then and then she's like, yeah, he'll probably be in the Olympics next year. And I was like, what are you talking about? And um, and then I saw the times, two minutes, uh, two hours, thirteen minutes. That's ridiculous. How do they, they run like 20, was it 26 miles or something? It's like, yeah, wow. And then the, in the Olympic record um, was uh, like a two hours and six minutes or something. And his time was just seven minutes off of that. So anyway, um, I hope that uh, you've been enjoying in that way, in one way or the other. I've just mostly been thinking about it. And I read an interesting article about a shot putter in the paper, which I, which I appreciated. Um, so I feel very lucky to have uh, grown up with the parents that I did. Um, for many reasons, and one of the reasons is uh, my parents have a good sense about leisure, and my father in particular. Um, he wasn't the kind of person who put too much effort into leisure. Uh, he was the kind of person who just went to leisure straight away. I remember one of my uh, early lessons uh, of this was my mom and I had been out doing something, and we came home, and um, my father had the camping tent, which was one, that's what he really loved to do for leisure, was just get to the woods. and. Uh, he had the tent all set up, and he had washed it, and uh, he's sitting in the, in the lawn chair, big smile on his face, kind of looking up in the sky. He's got a cigar in one hand, and I'm quite certain it must have been a beer in the other hand. Um, and I said, hey, Dad, what are you doing? And he said, I'm drying the tent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's clever like that, and so I appreciated the cleverness, but I also appreciated the sentiment um, that this wasn't a complicated thing. Um, that uh, uh, just enjoying uh, the situation, enjoying the, uh, the sun, uh, the breeze, and the beauty of uh, that moment in time. Uh, he really knows how to do that and uh, was a good model for me from, uh, I think, from a young age. In one of Dogen Zenji, the founder of this school of Buddhism uh, in Japan, one of his most famous writings, uh, called the Fukan Zazengi, or the Universally Recommended Instructions for Zazen, for meditation. There's this curious line in which Dogen says that we should take the backward step that turns the light and shines it back. In the next few weeks, I want to talk about this backward step. 
it's a very core of this tradition and a core of um, Zazen practice and a core of how it is that we can transform something uh, about uh, our life, about how it is that we're living. Uh, it's both a general instruction about how to orient through many, many, many things. It's also a very precise instruction about the nature of consciousness and about how it is that we experience things and how meditation can help us to uh, see more deeply into the nature of our own being and to live uh, in a different way. So it has this very broad kind of ap applica applicability and then down to this very, like very precision and some of the practice that we're doing. So I'm going to talk about this over the next few weeks. And today I'd like to talk more about this general orientation. Um, you know, sometimes if we think about uh, Buddhist practice, it sounds um, like retreat. It sounds like um, moving away from the troubles of a life, from the difficulty and the complexity of uh, of this world which we have uh, co-created. Uh, and that's true. Sometimes that's really necessary. But this backward step that Dogen Zenji is uh, encouraging us to take is one that allows us to find out what a true response is, not simply a reactivity to the world, but a true response to what is unfolding through this life, our own personal life, but also our collective life. And so it is the gateway to expedient means. It's the gateway to the Buddha Dharma um, flowing into and through uh, our, our life. I've told this story many times uh, when I was first studying with my teacher, Keira Roshi, in Sendai. Um, Japan was where his, he was abbot of a um, family temple there. And I showed up and started sitting Zazen with him and he started teaching me. And I had lots of questions and he would um, let me badger him with the questions for hours on, on end. And it was really wonderful. I, I, uh, I reflect now on really how lucky I was to fall into that situation. At the time, I didn't think of it as lucky. I was, just, I'm on my path, you know, I'm doing the thing. I'm, just, I'm practicing hard. Um, and now I look back and I was like, oh, 10% me, 90% everything else. <laughs> Maybe 1% me, 99% everything else. Anyway, so he said to me one day, I'll never forget it. He said, Ejo, where's the future? And I do not know, Master. <laughs> Where is the future? I mean, I knew it was a setup. And, um, and he said, it's behind you. It's behind you. The future is behind you. And he was quite animated about it. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, everyone thinks they're walking into the future. You think that moment to moment that you're headed into the future and you can look and see what's coming. But he said, that's not how it is. He said, the future is behind you. We're walking backwards, right? That we're going into the future. We're going into what we can't see, what we can't know. And everything that you think you know, everything you think you see um, is really your memory. Right? It's really your karma. That's what it is that you're seeing. And so in practice, what we have to do is we have to practice like we're walking backwards. We're walking into what can't be seen. Right? And when we do that, the only way to make it work is to pay total attention to your feet. Right? That's the only way. And so being the type of um, youth that I was, I took up walking backward, and I highly recommend it. Um, if you find a place that you feel uh, safe enough, um, I was kind of reckless, and so I just kind of did it anywhere. Um, waiting at the stoplights is really tricky, because <laughs> those are there for really good reason. <laughs> they might just be your memory, but they're a memory that helps you not get hit by a car. Um, but anyway, if you find a place, to try that out a little bit. What's it like to walk backwards? Just the, the, the feeling, the conscious feeling of what it's like to step back into what you don't know. And while you're doing that, think about, oh, this is kind of how my life is. What will tomorrow bring? None of us can know. What will an hour from now bring? What will for a moment from now bring? We don't know. 
And actually, that's the freedom and spontaneity of life. Right? It's not a problem, although it presents challenges. Is actually invigorating to experience uh, that freshness of the unknown. We can study if we're walking backward, either literally or um, metaphorically, um, how our attention changes. Rather than affixing our attention on what we see and trying to make sense of it, we say, oh, I see that. It's not unimportant. It's a memory. It's telling me something about where I am. But it's not the immediate information. And so I receive it, and I have to let it go to pay attention to what's right here at my feet. Very immediate information of this moment. As soon as you grasp that information, it becomes a memory. We use a term in, um, in uh, Western Buddhism a lot, which I think is confusing. And the word is intimate. And the reason I think it's confusing is because almost always we think of that in a kind of romantic way. Mostly we use that term intimate in that way. I remember um, many, many years ago, and there was some trouble in the Sangha, and um, uh, I had had a falling out with one of the uh, core members, and we were processing that as, the, as a, a community a lot. And the, those of us that were in kind of a small group working with it, we kept saying, like, well, we have this very intimate relationship, but in these other places it was difficult. And finally someone said it was so important. They said, you know, we probably shouldn't say that you had an intimate relationship in a kind of public way, because that means that you were romantically involved. Um, and there's a, oh, okay, this word intimate, which we use uh, so freely in this, this tradition. Um, um, mostly we don't, we don't use that that way. When we're talking about intimate here, we're talking about a recognition of our complete entwinement with the world. That there's not even a slight gap between what you think of as yourself and the rest of everything. You know, we live in this world where there's air, right? And so we sort of forget about the air, and we just consider space, and we think, oh, Leticia's over there, I'm over here. There's just space. But this intimacy says, no, of course, Leticia is there, and I'm here. But there's total continuity. There's not a gap. We enact this every time we make gosho. We think you put your hands together. You know, in our school, we... We put our hands together like this. You don't have to do it really like, mm. although but young monks get trained that way. Like if you're a heiji, this guy will walk around and say, your, 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 what do you call these fingernails? Your fingernails aren't white. And that means you're not pressing it together tight enough. <laughs> I don't recommend that as a practice. But just, uh, just, you know, they're all the way together. Not like this, not like this, not like that. Completely together. And the thumbs are like this. This is a mudra. Right? It's a sacred enactment that we do with our hands. And it's a sacred enactment of uh, intimacy. And, and that's going on all the time, that intimacy. So this walking backwards, the way our attention changes when we think, oh, it's not that I know everything that's going on. It's that I'm stepping back into what I don't know. What's right here at my feet? what's right here that I could use to navigate, right? Not my far off plans. Now, in fact, we say that this is not just a practice of attention, but it's how things are. We're not just practicing intimacy. We're not just trying to be intimate with things. We are intimate. We are completely pressed together. And we practice that total pressed togetherness. We call that awareness. We call it attention. We call it mindfulness. But it's not the mindfulness of grabbing onto something that you see clearly and you just hold it fixed. If you really want your mind to be attuned to what is present, you have to step back into what can't be known because everything is being birthed in each moment in a total freshness. Now in Buddhism, 
sometimes we use this term light. And there's a lot of different ways to write the word light in Chinese. In this phrase where Dogen Zenji says that the backward step turns the light and shines it back. He uses two characters for light. One of the characters for light is like the body of light. It's like the presence of light. And the other character means something like the movement of light, the shiningness of light, right? the verb, if light was a verb, which I guess it is, right? We say we light the room. So, um, uh, so this awareness, this consciousness, this intimacy of living, uh, we call light. And the backward step is what Dogen Zenji is referring to, how it is that we work with it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that next week, but I just want to drop in that, that uh, term for you. I heard something really interesting on the radio a couple of days ago. Uh, it really stuck with me. Maybe some of you heard it. It was, uh, I think it was an NPR or maybe um, one of public radio station. And it was about the advancement in prosthetic hands. Did anyone hear about this? No. So they're getting to the place now where prosthetic hands are becoming very functional. Right? Like they can, it's a little Luke Skywalker, right? You remember that? A little like dig, 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 and he's like, and his hand works, right? Um, in terms of the capacity, the robotic capacity of the hand to move, et cetera. But something that's been very difficult is this thing that's easy to forget about the functionality of a hand is not in its capacity to manipulate things solely. It's in its capacity to feel things. And so it turns out in a practical sense, if you have a robotic hand that doesn't feel, you can't pick up an egg. I mean, you pick it up, but you pick up a broken egg, <laughs> right? Because you don't know how, you don't have a feed, the proper feedback loop that's necessary to work with the movement of the hand. And I think this is really something that bears thinking about. It's a kind of a, of a, of a symbolic thing. It's something that can teach us about our whole life. How much we will immediately focus on if we're lacking a hand, how do I regain the functionality of a hand would be to be able to do things with it. But when they talked with one of, the, one of the fellows who had lost his hand that was part of this research group, and they asked him why he was so excited about being able to touch, do you know what he said? He said, I long to touch my wife's hand. And they asked him, they said, but you have another hand. And he said, I know, but this is a great hole in my life that I don't have this hand. So to be able to touch her hand and to feel it, that we are touching each other, to know that through the hand brings a great healing to my heart. I'm paraphrasing, probably making it more poetic than what he said. <laughs> right. Well, think about that. What are your hands for? You know, they say this is what has gotten us into all this trouble. <laughs> you know, marvelous trouble, but trouble nonetheless. Opposable trouble, right? And all of the things that we can do to create a world, which is an extension of our mind's fabulous capacity to imagine and to see what is not there and then to put it into play through our hands. So it's our great gift. But if we only see it in one direction, which is what can be done with it, then we make a big mistake. What can you feel with them? I would say is the better part of the function of your hand. And in that touch, there's a kind of healing of wounds. In fact, I would think that most wounds have to do with the loss of the capacity to feel or to touch. 
Not that the wound itself was inflicted by that, although it often is, but what is the scar tissue? What is the thing that keeps the wound um, painful? The isolation of not being able to encounter and truly meet. And so when we think about this backward step, it's challenging to feel. But that's what its invitation to us is. Not just in what will I do, what will I get done, what will I make happen, but what will I pay attention to, what will I take care of simply by receiving it, not by doing something with it. Drying the tent. This is a natural order to this thing. We work hard on something. We should work hard. But if we don't also know how to stop and just pay attention, our work will pretty soon go off course. And um, if you haven't experienced in this, this in your life, you are not paying attention. Right? You are definitely doing this, every single person. Buddha included. And so the rhythm, okay, I'm talking about this large orient, larger orientation about the backward step, to develop this orientation in life where we don't only think about what there is to do, but we also think about what it is to receive. Mm -hmm. Receiving and employing is a phrase you'll hear sometime in this tradition, that we receive the world, we receive consciousness, we receive being, and we employ it. We do something with it. And then that also is a receiving. And there is uh, a continual uh, circle uh, of life. Now, if you're practicing uh, meditation, or in a more general sense, taking the Buddhist teachings and implying them to the way it is that you're living here, walking backwards, pay attention, don't always do stuff all the time. Also, just try to see what's happening. I had a great uh, um, judo uh, senior once. I used to do judo when I was a kid. And uh, when I was first in Japan and I was practicing judo and one of the um, uh, senior boys who had, uh, he graduated from the high school I was going to and he came back to you know, work out with us. And we're, we're um, going at it, you know. And he stopped at one point. He said, you're so easy to throw. <laughs> And I, I was, he was throwing me a lot. And I was like, why? And he said, because you always push. He said, that's all you do. All you do is you're pushing. You're trying to make something happen. So all I have to do is wait for you to push in an awkward way, and I stick my foot out, and you fall over. And he kept doing that. You know, um, It was really uh, direct um, uh, teaching. Right? So as we, put, as, we, as we start to employ this in our life, we say, okay, I'm going to make some room. I'm going to sit quietly for a while. I'm going to not only do, I'm going to receive, I'm going to pay attention. You will undoubtedly have a shift in experience. You, you will. And this is such a great thing because there's so much beauty that flows in this place. You, know, you can even be in pretty dumpy type of situation. You know, and you stop and you go, oh. Let me just be here. Let me just receive. And you're like, why is this bubblegum wrapper seem worthy of my attention? When I'm doing things, it's only in the way. It's only a nuisance. It's only inconsiderate people not throwing their garbage where they're supposed to, i.e. in big holes we dig in the ground. Why, that's better than leaving it on the street. I'm not totally sure. But, um, but, but that kind of mindset is gone, right? And it's all of a sudden the, the, this purple wrapper, this ridiculous purple wrapper is on the ground. And you know something different for having just been present with it. This kind of world opens up, a dancing worm. You know, the, uh, um, a couple weeks ago there was a, a screeching bird here. This is totally related and unrelated at the same time. I just remembered, though. It's a um, red-shouldered hawk. And uh, I thought it maybe was a, um, those guys who just never shut up. 
they're always fishing out around here. Osprey, Osprey. yeah, that would be Osprey. They're always, they're always going at it, you know. And um, but no, this is a this is a, a red winged hawk, and it's been perching up by our house just up the street, um, up in the tree quite a bit. So we've had really good, a really good look at it. Okay, that's it. It's not a metaphor for anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but. Uh, when you engage this way, you start noticing these things more. Right? You start noticing more. And those things that you're noticing, they can also teach you how to pay attention. Right? It's not just, oh, I know a whole bunch of names of birds, and so I'm going to... You know, you ever meet people like that that really know all the flowers, and they really want to just tell you the name of the flower to, so you know that they know the name of the flower. What well, is super annoying. Um, but, you know, it's fine. Oh, you know the flower name. Oh, great. Oh, good. Um, but uh, that's not the point, right? When you're really becoming intimate or you're allowing these things to teach you, they are your teachers. They tell you about this backward step. They tell you, you don't know who I am. Even if you know my name, you don't know who I am. Would you like to? Yeah. Every time they're saying that, would you like to? And we can answer. But to answer, we have to say, we have to admit, I don't know you. I can't. I can't label you and hold you within that label I have given you. That I have to step backward into your realm. When we do that, there is a shift. Um, and what I want to encourage you in is when you experience that, the natural thing to do is to try to grab it. That's the very natural thing to do and kind of savor, mm, savor it. And okay, give yourself a little savoring, that's fine. It's, it's fine to experience a little bit that way. But when you try to grab it with your mind, you do the exact opposite thing of what brought it about. It is now a memory, it's in front of you, you can see it, it's an experience, and you squeeze it, and it goes away. And then you're like, why is that wrapper on the ground? It's disturbing my garden. You're just back right in it in a, in a moment. So rather than trying to clutch the experience, which is marvelous, go for the real gold. There is real gold in this situation. It's teaching you how to live. Your orientation in life can shift through that experience. The way that you regard things can change. And that's, right, that's the real gold. The experience itself is wonderful, but it's completely fleeting. Right? And there'll be another one. If you hold on to that one, you don't get the next one. <laughs> right? So it's better to let it go. And then your awareness flows and you can have more. But if you allow it to change the way you regard things, if you allow it to lead you into a different kind of relationship with other beings, then this way of experiencing becomes much more natural. It becomes a kind of path. And this is our ancient way of talking about um, spiritual practice in the East Asian, all kind of East Asian traditions, and particularly Buddhism, that there is a way, there's a Tao, there's a path. And it is there with your feet. It's not, you don't find it right out there in front of you and see that it's there and then go down it. It's not that kind of path. Now, sometimes there's a gate, like you come to a temple, there's a gateway, there's a walkway. Great, come on, sit down. That's also a path, but this path I'm talking about that appears, it appears as you walk. Right? It's not outside of you. And as we practice this type of backward stepping, um, through that reorientation, we begin to see in a new way not by outward goals or objects, but there's a kind of a true vision uh, that can see that there's no separation and move through that no separation, which is just the opposite of retreat. Then when things need done, you can do them with that heart, and they have a, a very different um, possibility when cared for in that way. 
So next week, I'm going to talk a little bit more about cultivating this mind, about how consciousness springs from this intimacy, and how Zazen is this practice of turning that light of consciousness so that it illuminates itself. This is the classical way of talking about it. Um, and then Zazen practice becomes the daily way that we refresh and we reconnect with this way of being that helps us then carry that throughout our day and through the times that are very uh, complicated because you're both moving forward towards a goal and moving backwards into total um, not knowing at the same time. Um, but we'll get to that maybe the third week. So if there's any questions or comments, we have a little time. Hi. I know you said you wanted to talk about this stuff in the music. Mm -hmm. When I recorded it, I was just, I don't want to do this. I don't know if you have heard of it now, but I don't want to do one. Mm -hmm. And when you played Rachmaninoff or Beethoven, you were in your own mind. And that's, we could say that's exactly the same thing as Zazen. That it's not just that we're mimicking the Buddhas and ancestors, that we are in the mind of the Buddhas and ancestors, and we're also in our own mind. And that mysterious unseparation is what we call transmission. It is that we receive something we've already had. We don't, have to, we don't have to go anywhere to get it, and yet we're also oblivious to it. And we need that um, um, oh, relation isn't even the right word. We need that practice of knowing the intimacy to make it real. And um, I think music is a perfect example of that. Oh, I, same thing, yeah. And, uh, you know, it really is just possible for me to do it. Mm -hmm. yep. So. Maybe better in a hole. Yeah. Maybe better in a hole. Okay. Yeah. So because I'm confident about in my neighborhood and in my goals that I have to get my goals. Mm -hmm. So I can get it now. Yeah. Yeah. Great. But I, I, I can jump to it. I don't have to be looking at it. Maybe you have a point of practice. <laughs> you know, I think this is the thing. Like, you're not going to save the world picking up those butts. Yeah, so no problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's, that's my point. So even if, you know, I'm, I'm sort of waxing eloquent about the wrapper, like it's going to make you feel good, which it could, you know. But, the, but that's not the point. The point isn't that your experience is a, is a feeling good experience. But... Um, can picking up a cigarette butt be just picking up a cigarette butt? Um, it takes extraordinary attention to allow it to be so. Um, mostly, it needs to fit, if we're going to do it, if it's going to animate our action, it needs to fit into our framework of how it is that we have organized, judged, and judged the world. And so if we're going to pick up that, that butt, we're animated to do it, probably will include a big bunch of karma around those damn smokers. Inconsiderate smokers, people who kill turtles, whatever it is, you know, big, but, I mean, we have a big thing about it. And so the act, of, the act of picking it up is a huge load. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do it through that, but I'm saying that there's not so much freedom in it. And this allows us to do something else so we could find another, you know, another pathway. There's that.
that little piece of foam is your teacher. <laughs> yeah, you're lucky to find them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, one of um, uh, my students and um, uh, close friends, um, his name is Jume. You may meet her sometime. She came for the for the uh, mountain seat ceremony. She lives in um, Washington D.C. now. She's a scholar, a Buddhist scholar. Um, anyway, long, long time ago, um, we were we were talking about just this thing, and she said something that really stuck with me. A kind of concept or a way of describing this. She had done ballet for a long time. And she said, when I, when I dance and I put my hand up, she, when she did it, it was quite magical. I mean, it doesn't feel so magical. <laughs> um, she said, there's one way where if I, look at the, if I look at just my arm and I do it, then I just get stuck in my arm. And there's another way when I do it, I have to see my arm, but I have to look past my arm. And when I do that, then then the feeling of the posture of how my arm is changes. And the limitations of seeing my arm are no longer present because my arm is part of the continuity of being. Um, I mean, I'm paraphrasing what she was saying. And, uh, and this is true with all of our seeing, that, that uh, literal seeing and also the way we use the word seeing for how we organize the world and think about things. So objects are not our enemies. They're not, they're not even our limitations, but it's how do we regard the object that becomes um, uh, a really our point of practice. That each one of those objects or fixed ways of seeing things, they are also an invitation to see past them, to see into them, to see through them, um, to be seen by them. They have all of those possibility, but our tendency is to, is to lock into I'm the subject seeing that object and everything to go very opaque there. So that's part of what we're doing in the backward step is in that turning the light rather than just taking the light of our consciousness and putting it on something and transfixing it. We're allowing that thing to turn the light and shine back. And so there's the freedom of illumination, which is the root of consciousness, not just affixing it to to things in a solid way. Um, so as you sit and practice, um, you can see that those things are both present and then learning that they're not really separate. That's the hard part because we might have a feeling of the freedom of the illumination where we're, we're no longer addicted to the object. And then it seems like the object is the problem. We've got to get the objects away. And there's a period of practice where that's important or, or a side of practice that's important where objects fall away. But this other side is also really important, that the objects don't fall away. And they teach us, you know. And um, again, sometimes the light is really illustrious and beautiful, and sometimes the light is a stinky cigarette butt. But, <laughs> you know. mm -hmm. So from a Buddhist perspective, we talk about desire in a couple different ways. One is the immediate um, craving that uh, is underlying a, a particular moment or movement. So that's one, that's one aspect of desire. And then another aspect of desire is karmic formation. So there is a deep inclination towards that craving. Right. So, um, so we can experience states where the craving drops off. 
And in fact, that's a, that's a really important thing to do in um, uh, practicing Buddhism, practicing meditation, to come up against our own craving and then to, to stay with it in a way that it can open up and fall away. Like it used to be for me about three days into a really strong retreat, pizza, like just pizza. My whole being is pizza. And then we're getting like this rice gruel, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, right? You know, it's just like my whole body's pizza. So you can encounter that kind of thing, and you work with it very, very directly. It's a little bit different than like, um, like cutting yourself off and kind of being stiff towards it. It's more like, oh, yeah, that craving's there, that desire, that deep desire is there. How can I stay present with it and see through it and allow it to open up? And if we, uh, particularly in meditation, our mind is, uh, as we take this backward step, it has a capacity it doesn't have when we're chugging forward. And we're like, okay, I'll just eat the salad because I shouldn't be eating pizza. But we're, we're still sort of just letting our mind chomp on the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and the desire doesn't really go away and we get tighter and tighter. Within meditation, we can say, oh yeah, of course I have this desire. And here's the rice gruel, and, um, and, and we can work with it. The desire, which is our fundamental karmic formations, those, it's not really helpful for us to think that we are going to get rid of them. Well, in fact, when we do that, we oftentimes get very awkward. We get like this, this like self-hatred because desires arise in us very naturally and we think they shouldn't be. And we're very judgmental of the desires that arise in us. And so it's much better to come from this first idea about desire and let it work its way down and unlock these more fundamental karmic formations of desire rather than thinking like we're just going to dig those out. And then, and then we do the proper uh, meditation and the cultivation that allows us then to get down deeper into the root of those desires. Um, but when we just go straight for them, mostly they, they turn into, they get, uh, it gets pretty ugly. And, um, and then we're, we're creating other kind of problems. Um, I would say my experience of desire, desirelessness on the, on that first level, because I don't know what desirelessness is on the other level, like total desirelessness that uh, Buddha is the, and Arhats, they, they have rooted that out. Um, so there's a facet of our consciousness that knows that freedom. When it shows up, when that freedom shows up is marvelous. Because, um, because, and it's, it's, it's marvelous because it's free, not in the way that now I am unencumbered. That's not the freedom that's so wonderful about it. What's so wonderful about it is everything can be present. And that deep intimacy is the underpinning of your seeing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and that is the, um, the, the, wound, the, the wounds that we carry that are so much about alienation from ourself and from the rest of the world and from each other, um, there's so much rich healing that is, that is in that, that place. Yeah. yeah. So I really encourage you, take, you know, take that seriously. Like, what is it to work with desire? And, um, but don't, like, uh, uh, especially in this kind of Puritan um, uh, tra traditions that we've come from, there's a lot of karma in there about how we'll, we sort of devalue ourselves because we have desire. And uh, Buddhism really, if you go to a Buddhist country, this is surprising to people sometimes um, because Buddhism seems so like stoic and so like, but, uh, but Buddhist cultures that have had Buddhism for a long time are much, much more generally speaking um, um, uh, kind to themselves about the quality of, the quality of, of desire, um, not making it such an enemy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Curiosity about it is really good. I have one, one of my really big, uh, um, uh, what would be the word, guidelines is um, my vices, like, keep them in front of me. Like, that's the first step. Keep them in front. 
you know, like when, when we don't keep them in front, we pretend like we don't have them or we think we don't have any of those kinds of like desires for things that are, um, I mean, I'm using vice very loosely here, whatever it might be, you know, be for you. TikTok, I tried TikTok for a while. That was like, whoa. <laughs> well, that could grab you real quick. Yeah. <laughs> but the deal is if it's not in front of you, it will definitely get behind you. And when it gets behind you, then it controls you. It points you where, it just points you, it's like you've got the stick hooked to your back and it's just pointing you. But if you can keep it in front of you, that first step is not saying, well, I don't have that desire or have that vice. But if I keep it in front of me, now there's a capacity to, to work with it. And, um, and so that, I think that's a really, it's, it's a different way of thinking about our problematic desires. Yeah, yeah. So what we want to do with those, the, the desire, you know, like many people have, in fact, I would say I don't remember meeting anybody that doesn't have a deep desire to be of help to others. I think it's just in us. It's, we're hardwired for it. And some people feel it on the surface more strongly than others, but I think we're really, we have that. So how do we understand the desire in a way that we can hook it to, in a Buddhism we would call vow. So desire, the desire, like our, our desire to do whatever work that we want to do um, or how we want to um, live a good life, um, uh, is that just for our own kind of self-satisfaction or is there something beyond our self-satisfaction which is animating it? And if we look into that, what is beyond just our self-satisfaction that's animating it, we find this deep current that's so much more powerful than just my personal desire for it. In Buddhism, we call that vow. And as we understand that vow more deeply, then our orientation through it becomes uh, much less about the immediate um, kind of impulse for uh, satisfying our desires and becomes much more about this deep groundedness in work that we um, know goes beyond ourself. It doesn't just accrue a feeling of fulfillment to me. It has this, it has this wider um, thing. But, but again, we don't want to kiss, kill that desire. That's not the point. But we want to explore it more deeply in the way that those harmful desires that are really just about kind of self-satisfaction, we, we want to be able to touch them so that they can open and melt. Pizza's still delicious. I mean, if you like it, I love pizza. Um, uh, but I don't have to be caught by it. And in the same way, these things which seem more wholesome, they are more wholesome. They're, they're, they're turning towards something we really care about. We also want to allow them to melt and open up so that we can find their true root, which is much deeper than the immediate experience of it. So what, is, what happens when you discover your root is, I never feel good enough when I do all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Then we let that melt away. Mm -hmm. And it comes to remind. Yeah, yeah, then you have to keep you have to keep looking. Oftentimes that's that's that there are layers of all these things happen. There are all of, all of these things. There are many skillful and many unskillful type things. And so um, in, the, in the work on understanding our vow more completely, we recognize, again, come, coming back to the walking backwards, we recognize I don't know where I'll go. But because I don't know where I'm going, I have to pay more attention to what is fundamentally important to me. And when, when we tell like, oh, doing a bunch of things because I don't feel good enough doesn't work actually. It doesn't fulfill me in the deepest level. Then we can start working on the way we're walking. But it happens right there in the stepping, not in a kind of like uh, worked out system that we could apply. You know, it has to be right there in the walking itself. Yeah. And so next week when I'm talking about meditation a little bit, this is one of the ways that we really face parts of our consciousness that have those kind of uh, real um, uh, difficult voices um, and we can learn to be present with them. Mm-hmm.